Today I want to talk about a catalyst. It's going to be a little different day because I want to start with some stories. What is a catalyst? A catalyst is a person or thing that causes change. And I know that we all really want change. And maybe not the kind of change that we're experiencing right now. Because what we're experiencing right now, there's a lot of hopelessness. There's a lot of darkness. But when I talk about catalysts for change, I'm talking about we as the body of Christ can come in as those that are filled with the power and the hope and the light of life that can come into every situation and know that as we bring in the life of Jesus, that we can bring in that hope that is needed. We bring in light into the darkness. We bring in in such a way that as we've been transformed by his love and his power and his goodness, that we can walk into these situations and we can bring that same hope straight to a dying world. We can bring change. I got a friend that's, that when he starts talking to uh, Christian crowds, he just starts with, hello, world changers. That's who we are. That is who we are. And I just want to tell a couple quick stories. This started with me with Advancing Native Missions. My wife began to, to work for Advancing Native Missions. And we went to our first winter retreat on top of Wintergreen Mountain. And I sat there. <laughs> Y'all go ahead to forgive me. I get emotional about this stuff. This really touched me. I sat there for the very first time as indigenous missionaries from all every continent on the face of the planet began to tell their story of how they would go in with their lives on the line, putting death right on the line every time they go out to share the gospel and listening to how they were bringing that light into the darkness. And the thing that really got me is under great persecution, these very missionaries were the most joyful people I'd ever been around in my life. I was like, how do they face this and have so much joy? It just left me weeping under the table as I'm listening and listening and listening. And through that, through a and I've been able to travel the world. Y'all have heard my stories of Tibet, but I don't know if you've heard this story. We were in Tibet. I'm, I'm living at 13,000 feet above sea level, and I could actually breathe, believe it or not. And we found out that the Dalai Lama was going to be in town. We said, well, let's go see the Dalai Lama. Man, we don't know what is this about. We get to the fairgrounds, and there's 175,000 people in the hot sun sitting for hours, actually for three days, sitting in this hot dust. And while the monks got water and food, the masses just sat there all day burning up in the sun. We walked down into the crowd. I was from, from here to that row, uh, close to the Dalai Lama, turn around and look back, and I could tell not one person knew what he was talking about. He was there just wah, 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 wah. and as, they, as I looked at their faces, there was just nothing but darkness. I looked in their eyes, and there's just nothing but this emptiness and this darkness and this pain. And as I looked into their eyes, I heard the Lord say this. It was as close to the audible voice that I've ever heard. He reminded me from John 1, verse 10. It says, I came into the very world I created. But it didn't recognize me. I came to my own people, and they rejected me. I was overwhelmed with a sense of the love that Jesus had that compelled him to come and to die for every single one of those that were sitting there in the dust. And everyone in that he wanted to have life. And right beyond that, inside of my heart, there was this response that happened. Who will go for me? And I said, who's going to tell them? They're dying. Who's going to tell them? Next day, I'm, in a, I'm over 17,000 feet above sea level now in the Himalayas in this tent, drinking yak butter tea that just got churned from a yak stomach. I am not lying. And I'm sitting there, and the 22-year-old former Buddhist uh, young man was interpreting, and I, we were watching the rituals that they were doing in their little private Buddhist altar and I said tell me what we're what we're going to be doing here and he said this oh these are our disciples I said whoa 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 wait a minute wait a minute you know I'm watching them do the Buddhist thing well don't you know discipleship starts before you're born again and it changed my world all of a sudden I realized when we go we go to get involved in people's lives 
just like Jesus came to us. We don't wait for them to come to our church. We don't wait for them to come to our culture, our grounds. We're to go to them and begin to walk the love of Jesus every day with who he is in us. Then, of course, you've heard me talk about Cuba. Man, this one changed my life. I'm there, and I meet Emilio. This man spoke into my life. And one of the first things he said, you know, he said the very first command is to be fruitful and multiply. Every human being is created in the image of God. And inside of every single human being, there's this potential and this desire to have children to multiply on the earth, to subdue it. That is what he said. But then he said, but then Jesus said, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So in that, we know that he's talking about be fruitful and multiply naturally. And then Jesus said, but then we're not only to have natural children, believers, followers of Jesus, disciples, we are to have spiritual children. We are to produce spiritual children. We are called to go make disciples. What does that mean? My son is sitting over here. He did not exist until we had fruit. We made a baby. How is it that you start to make disciples? I always saw little groups of Bible study together making it. Well, that's one way. But when you make something, it doesn't exist before you make it. We're to go to the unbelieving world, a broken world, and begin to preach the gospel and walk with them. As they receive Jesus, we begin to nurture them, disciple them, so they become true and send them out to their realm of influence so that they make disciples. Each believer is a catalyst to bring change to lives, to families, to households, to neighborhoods, to this whole Shenandoah Valley and beyond. It's life on life. Fruitfulness only comes out of intimacy. That's how God designed it. It's about relationship. Mark 3.13. Afterward, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to himself the men he wanted to be his close companions. So they went up to him. He appointed the 12 who he named apostles. Now listen to this. He wanted them to be continually at his side as his friends so that he could send them out to preach and have authority to heal the sick and cast out demons. See, I like the part where Jesus says, hey, I want to be your friend. We sing songs about, hey, Jesus is our friend. You know, we want to be intimate with Jesus, and Jesus wants to be intimate with us. Everything starts right there because fruitful starts within the intimacy. But here's the part that we've never gotten well. He called him to himself that they would be his friends, his constant companions. And then he said this, so that the end result wasn't us sitting around like a powwow around a campfire listening to Jesus talk. That wasn't the end result. So that they would go preach, cast out demons and heal the sick. What? We are catalysts for the glory of God. Even the very first day that Jesus raises from the dead, that in the Easter night, his first words as he walked into the room, threw a wall, scared the heck out of everybody, and said, whoa, whoa, peace, be still. And it just like, was me, it's me. You know what his first words were? It wasn't to pat him on the head, hug him up, have a party, some cupcakes and some Kool-Aid. His first words were this, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so am I sending you. You think it's a priority for him? If we want to be true disciples of Jesus Christ, we will be catalysts to his gospel to bring change into people's hearts and lives. Guys, there's no other time in my short history that we have seen that people are ready to receive the power and love, stability and hope and light that we have. I want to share just a couple, three or four things real quick uh, from Luke 5. 
We find Jesus here preaching in Luke 5. We find him, he's preaching on the Sea of Galilee. Crowds are pressed into him again. There's nowhere for him to go, so he lists a guy with a couple boats. He goes out into the boat, and he's preaching from the boat. We've seen this over and over again in Jesus. He's preaching from the boat. And at the end of the sermon, there he is. People start to go away. And he looks at the owner of the boat. He says, hey, man, thanks a lot for the boat. Uh, let, me t- let me tell you do something. Why don't you take your net? Now, they've already cleaned their nets. They were already done for the day. They already cleaned them. He says, hey, take your nets and throw them on the other side. Go out in the deep and throw them out there. The response was, hey, wait a minute. You know what? You're a great preacher, but you're a terrible fisherman. You need to know that we've already done this all night. We didn't catch a thing. Jesus said, okay, I'm just telling you, if you take your net, cast it on the over there. What happened? They cast their net, and the nets were so filled that they started to break. He had to call the other boat over to get the fish in there because the boats were sinking. There were so many, 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 many fish. And verse 8 says, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell on his knees before Jesus and said, Oh, Lord, please, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they'd caught as there were others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. And Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. Now listen to this. This always still amazes me. And as soon as they landed, they left everything, and they followed Jesus. As soon as, as, soon as they landed, because of this miracle, they left everything. You know what the Greek is for that? Everything. <laughs> to follow this man they had just met. Matthew 4.19 says, Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Without going into great teaching, what this says is, a disciple is one who follows Jesus, being transformed by Jesus, and is on mission with Jesus. I think we get the first two pretty good. We're going to follow Jesus. We're going to follow him to the Bible study. We're going to follow him to church. Hopefully he'll bless me at work. But if we're really following me, he'll be transforming our lives. But what is the end result of that? That we're on sent. We are his sent ones. A true disciple is a catalyst for transformation. There's four things I want to point out here real quick. Daily surrender, daily encounter, transformation, and on mission. Guys, if we're going to be those ones, we we have to look at surrendering it all to Jesus. Jesus did never meant to be an add-on to our lives, just to make us good and nice people. We are to surrender, to die. Peter's reaction to this encounter that he has is this. He left everything. Now think about it. He left his possessions, his boats, his nets. He left his livelihood. He left his business. He left his home. He left his family. He left his entire way of knowing how to live life. Everything that was ever familiar to Peter, he said, I will go. He left the familiar, the comfortable. He left his security. He left his safety. He left it all. And if we're going to live as disciples of Jesus Christ, if we're going to live to what he has called us to really do, to that which he's put inside of us, to be the catalysts of change, we must live and call others up to a life of abandonment. We must demonstrate and proclaim the real gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't just come to get us into heaven. He came to get heaven into us. And the way that we walk with him in that, there is a kingdom that was reestablished. The very kingdom of God now rules and reigns on this earth because Jesus sealed a covenant with us. And now we can walk in that covenant. But it's not that we just are happily, lazily going along. It will cost you everything. There's a cost that we pay to know these things, 
Galatians 2.20 says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself, gave it all for me. Just take a look at the boat again. Jesus comes and he, he says, Hey guys, if you recast your nets, I think my response probably would have been even more... Uh, I don't know, uh, vital, um, would have been um, different than Peter's. I probably would have never thrown the net. I don't know. But here's what he said. Listen, we've never done it this way before. We know what works. Well, how's that working for you today, Peter? They hadn't caught anything. But yet, they said, we want to stay with familiar. They hadn't caught anything. But it's not comfortable for us to throw the nets yet again. It's not familiar. It's not comfortable. What if he hadn't obeyed? We would probably never know Peter's name. What if he hadn't obeyed? He would have lost that moment. He would have lost that blessing. And he would have never changed the history. He, he became a catalyst. I'm convinced that in this room and around the world... The Holy Spirit is stirring and urging so many of us to leave those familiar things, to leave the comfortable things. I'm not saying just leave your job, but how about you recenter yourself for your job? What if your possessions don't have you? What if you've given them over to Jesus and say, Lord, you are Lord of my possessions. You must die. It costs you something. See, many times we want the blessings of God without paying the cost. There's a cost we must pay if we really want to follow Jesus. He obeyed, and he got past the familiar and the comfortable. Never settle for less than what God is calling you to do. Lay the familiar on the altar. Lay the comfortable down, and never refuse an opportunity to die. Because in that place that you say, Lord, I die to that, that's the place you will find resurrection power in your life. If you will die, that's the place you will find resurrection power. Peter found a miracle moment. What was his thing? Please leave me, for I'm such a sinful man. Daily encounter. Guys, we must give ourselves and expect a living God to make himself real to us in our lives and not just a, a book that we read, not just a sermon that we hear, not just a song on the radio, but to step into a living encounter with the living Jesus, to welcome his presence. I can see Isaiah 6 when it says, In the year Isaiah died, I saw his train fill the temple. His presence came. And I hear in Peter's voice the same thing we hear in Isaiah. He says, he falls as dead on his face. And he says, woe is me. I am such a sinful man. He thought he was going to die. But when God in his presence showed up, he didn't, he didn't point out his sin. He cleansed them from it all. He touched his lips and he cleansed them. And he said, who will go for me? He said, Lord, I will go for you. He didn't wait till he went to seminary. He didn't wait till he had enough Bible scriptures memorized. He sent him out from the presence. The staging area of your life is the presence of God every day. We must give ourselves to the presence of God. Jesus came to open up a new and living way so that we can walk in his presence. We can know his presence. He invites us to abide in his presence. Not the omnipresence where we know, oh, God is out there. He created everything. I'm talking about the manifest presence of God. We can know it. We can walk in it. It's the very glory. It's a word that means weight. The reality is substance to it, not just an idea. It's the very presence of God that we can walk in and move in and have a daily encounter with. I love Exodus 33, one of my greatest, most favorite scriptures, where Moses says, if you don't go with us, if your presence doesn't go, please, please don't send us. 
And what was his response? Oh, I'm going with you. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Anybody tired? How about this? What if we wait on the presence of God to fill us, to help us? In 16b, he's talking about how if you have found grace in your sight, please, please go with us. Because your presence is what marks us as different than everybody else. See, your presence among your church should be that mark. When I walk into a, a cafe, I say, Lord, please may they know your presence as I walk in here. One of my favorite stories, I have, I have a couple of coffee shops I love to go to. Uh, y'all, y'all know that I'm one of those coffee snobs, and I, I love to just fellowship over coffee. There's this one coffee shop I go to. I was in there, and I noticed that this one barista just reacted to me. like just couldn't stop all the time. was just talking to me all the time. I was in there one day, and I just the love of God just came all over me for him. I didn't know what else to do. I just walked up to him. I said, I got to tell you, I'm over here. I'm praying for you. And I can feel God's love for you. Just He loves you so much. This barista starts bawling right there. And come to find out, a person had come off the Appalachian Trail, came down that morning and said, God just wants me to tell you he loves you. And I came along. I had a person with me. I got to pray for this barista. Now, whenever I go over to the shop, sometimes I don't even get in the shop. They will run out of the shop and hug me before I even get in. Why? It's the presence of God. We get to carry his presence. Moses then said, Lord, can you show me your glory? And of course, you know the story. He's at a place by me, and he said, you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be my glory passes by, and I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand as you pass by. I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but you will not see my face. Now, there's a lot of ways to preach that. But God was not showing him his backside. What this really means is this. After I'm gone, you're going to continue to know my presence. You will live in my afterward. Listen, I want, to have, I want to have encounters with God. When we come together in this place, we should be inviting an encounter with God together. There is nothing better than when the body of Christ comes and we together in worshiping him invite his presence and we can encounter the reality where prophetic ministry comes forward and begins to set people free, where his healing power comes and begins to heal the sick. His presence should be the mark. We can be alone with him. We can worship him in stillness and quietness and invite his presence to be with us. When I get with him, I just wait. I'm learning more and more to wait until all that emotional stuff is focused and I become aware of his presence. And when I do that, I open his word. And now I'm not just encountering this. It's not a feeling. It's a change. Something happens. But now... I'm having an encounter in his word. I'm hearing his voice. I'm getting revelation. And you know what happens? It begins to transform me. The presence of God will transform you. We should, if we're going to be catalysts, we need to be people of his presence, transformed by his glory and walk in that way. The measure of success should not just be I, I read my Bible today. Please read your Bible. It starts there. It should be the Lord spoke to me and I, I knew him today. I'm knowing him today. Now, on your uh, slide there, it says 1 Corinthians 3.18. I turned in the wrong scripture. It's 2 Corinthians 3.18. I'm going to read you the one that I really meant. So all of us who had veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we're changed into His glorious image. We're changed. And when we're changed, we should become change agents, catalysts to those that are hurting in a dying world. Yes, we should come together and gather. 
We should be here and encourage one another. We should be encouraged by the Word of God. But that's not the highlight of the week. The highlight of the week should be when we're walking with a family member or a neighbor or a coworker, and the Lord comes in his presence and we're able to minister life. We be the church, not just go to church because we're on mission. We've been transformed and we've been put on mission. It's not that God's church has a mission it said, God's mission, see that? Didn't finish. Y'all reading that on the screen? I'm going to finish it so that you remember it. It's not that God's church has a mission. It's that God's mission has a church. We must be followers of Jesus that go on mission. He brought them to himself that he may send them. See, Matthew, we read Matthew 28, go make disciples. Matthew starts with, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And he ends with, go make disciples. Mark starts with, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And he ends with, go preach with these signs following. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, talk in new tongues. Oh, all that weird stuff. It's what the world needs. Luke starts with, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Chapter 40, 24 ends with, go preach the gospel. Discipleship is connected to evangelism. We must go make disciples. We must reproduce spiritual babies. As we are being touched and transformed in his presence, we then need to go reproduce who we are becoming in Christ to others, to teach them to obey everything that we've been taught, and then send them into their own realm of influence. That's how things begin to change. Jesus first loved you. He initiates you into a covenant, and then he sends you to go multiply the kingdom and every single one of you, there's seeds. When you leave your time with the Lord, you lead with a bag of seed to go spread like a farmer. To some will fall on good ground, some on bad ground. You know the whole parable. But some is going to find 30, 60, and 100 fold. And it will begin to produce. You know, inside an apple, we know how many seeds are in an apple but you don't know how many apples are in a seed. And I would venture to say this, there's orchards inside of a seed. There's orchards inside of you. First Peter 1, verse 1 and 23. From Peter, apostle of Jesus, the anointed one and chosen one, who have been scattered abroad like seed into the nation, like refugees, to those living in Pontus and Galatia, and Cappadocia, and throughout the Roman province of Asia and Bithynia. For, though, for through the eternal and living word of God, you have been born again. And this seed that he planted within you can be destroyed, but will live and grow uh, inside of you forever. Guys, you're a seed, and you've been sent to a specific ethos, a specific people, a people group that you are familiar with, that you speak the language. They're in your family. They're in your neighborhood. They're at your workplace. They're living here all out through Augusta County, Waynesboro, Stanton, Shandell Valley, and beyond. This is your people that you are sent to. And those seeds, some are going to produce some fruit. Some are going to make people as miserable as can be. Sometimes you know you're making headway when you're telling people about Jesus because <laughs> it makes them miserable. You know, because the Holy Spirit starts working and they, they, just, they don't know what to do with that. It makes them miserable until they die. And then they will live. See, Jesus' eyes is focused on the harvest itself. Luke 10, 1 and 2, the Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs 
to all the towns and places he planned to visit, there were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest, who is in charge of the harvest, and ask him to send more workers into the fields. Guys, we're like seed. And when we gather, we don't gather to build a tent and say, oh, how good it is. When we gather, we gather to scatter. When we gather, we gather to go. We get encouraged. We get trained. We get healed because we're being transformed to go transform others out there. We gather to go. This should be only one highlight of the week. We should come with the testimonies of being the church when we come together. This is not on the slide, but I want to tell you, the world is all about power. We can see, can you, you can't watch the news or, or read the paper. You can feel it in the air the power struggles that are going on around the world in our nation right now. But guys, we have the power. The Holy Spirit has come to dwell in us. Acts 1 8 says, and this, and when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall receive power. Why? To be my witnesses throughout Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Guys, there is no longer time for us just to mess around. We need to be filled by the baptism of the Holy Spirit and walk in this kind of power so that we can be witnesses that he's called us to be. And when we go, it's like no longer stuck in Jerusalem. This church, this new church that was birthed that day got stuck in Jerusalem until all of a sudden there was persecution. And when persecution came, they began to scatter. Renee and I just went to the most wonderful conference with Foursquare up and down the Atlantic District. Durant was part of putting that together. It was a crazy thing. And the, just the power of God that just settled upon us. We're coming back up through there. and well, We had planned on maybe stopping and seeing our son in Blacksburg. And right before you get to the Floyd exit, there's another exit. And there's a uh, gas station there. We stopped to get some gas and... I look over, there's two ladies, men in a t-shirt table, selling t-shirts. And you know me, I thought, okay, wow, here we go. This is my assignment for today, Jesus, so let's go see what happens. I look over, Renee's already over there. I said, dang, oh, she already beat me to it. <laughs> so I pumped the gas to go over. And she's already grabbed one of the girls and gone inside. I'm like, what in the world? It was a cold, rainy day. She goes inside and she buys them some hot chocolate and some coffee. And we're over there, and she wants to buy a T-shirt to support them. Come to find out, it's a Christian ministry. And this girl's telling me her testimony. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. this is backwards. The other girl that was there had just, was kind of new in her faith. And we got to pray and had a prophetic word for the, the first girl. The second girl is named Michaela. And we're praying, and then I've never seen my wife do this before. Renee looks at her, and she goes, you baptized in the Holy Spirit? And the, the other girl goes, Pfft. Like, uh-huh, God's got your number. And the girl goes, um, short story is, by the time we were done, the girl was baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues right there in the parking lot when we, when we drove off. <laughs> Guys, we get to have these encounters every day because we're those that are scattered. We are scattered. The church in the early days scattered. And it says, they went throughout all the earth beginning to preach the gospel, cast out demons, heal the sick. And many, many came to know Jesus. And it wasn't the preacher. It wasn't Paul. He wasn't even Paul yet. It was, it says in chapter 11 of Acts, ordinary men that went and they preached the gospel. Who's the ordinary men and women? It's you. That's me. Guys, we've been practicing these things on Thursday nights. It's kind of been a prototype thing that we've been going through and practicing. And some of the, the, in fact, I think everybody that has been walking with Renee and I on Thursday nights is here. And I would like Renee to come up. And I'd like my Thursday night gang to come up. Would y'all come on up here? I'm not going to embarrass you. They go, oh, no, they didn't tell us this. Come on up, Chuck. Come on up, guys. Come on up. I'm bringing them up here because I want to show you what God's been doing. 
Guys, every time we come together, I can't tell you how incredible it is that we have these encounters with the Holy Spirit. We give ourselves to the practice of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We apply ourselves to becoming mature disciples that are making and multiplying disciples in the kingdom of God. We give ourselves to accountability to mature in Christ. We identify our realm of influence, and we, we, we live sent lives into that, that realm. And we begin to make disciples that are initiating discipleship in their own realm of influence. Renee's going to tell you a couple of testimonies. Man, look at this. Isn't this incredible? This is this our team, my, man. This I feel is like our team. Out of way. This is our team that's become family. So yes, we're family, stuck together sure. whether we want to be or not, right? That's kind of how it works. Um, I just, just a couple things. Uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about what's been happening Thursday night. You know, um, like it says in Mark, even Jesus himself said, you know, that these signs mark his presence. And in Mark, it says that the believers, there will be signs that follow. And uh, one of the things that has happened on Thursday nights is the Lord has blessed us with his presence. And uh, he has really shown himself that, yes, he, he likes this way of doing his business. And, um, so what you see up here represents four different churches. Uh, it's a, the, the thing that's on our heart is unity in the body of Christ, not one church better than another, one church in competition with another. Uh, one of the RDs at um, A&M puts it this way. He said, there's too much work out there to eliminate some of the, of the working population, right? It's just too much. There's too many people hurting and dying and sick and just out of it. Everybody needs to be on board, and we can't waste time fighting with other people that, that say they're believers. It's just a waste of time. Um, so anyway, there's four churches represented here, and I'm just going to uh, talk about a few things. These guys don't want the microphone, so I'll speak for them. Um, <laughs> basically, some things that have happened. Of the people up here, three people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit within just a few weeks after us gathering for the first time. So I thought that was really cool. Um, also, we had um, quite a few significant healings. Um, there was uh, one lady who came, and she had severe um, gastrointestinal issues, and they were run, getting ready to run all kinds of tests. Um, it was like we don't know exactly what it was, but they were, they were scanning for things like cancers and all kinds of craziness. And um, we felt led to pray for her. We laid hands on her, and she said immediately she felt like, what was it, Chuck? It was like a wave, like a wave of God's presence. He, she said it was just like somebody took like a scoop and just kind of went through in, inside of her. And she left shaken, knowing that she had felt the presence of God. And when she went to the doctor, they couldn't find anything wrong with her. So, <laughs> you know, there was a healing there, okay? Um, uh, there was another couple that came just to visit, and they said, listen, um, the wife was experiencing... Uh, had been diagnosed with breast cancer, stage four. Um, they didn't give her much hope of survival. And they said, we just want to go somewhere where people believe that God heals and that they will pray for that. And they said, are you that? And we're like, come on, we'll do it. So they came over and um, we laid hands on them and there was a number of very, um, very pointed, direct words of knowledge and uh, the gift of healing, all kinds of things happened that day. They went to the doctors, and she had already scheduled to have, I think it was a lumpectomy, something like that. They had already decided to do a, a surgery. And they got in there, and all of the, the fingers on the, the tumors that they removed had, were gone. They were like, wait a minute, the, the scans show that there should be fingers on these. And wait a minute, they're smaller than they should have been. This is not stage four. This is like, she doesn't even need chemo. We're taking the tumors out, and she's done. So... Um, God just did some really incredible healing things in the physical realm. There's also been, I think, the thing that's really meant a lot to me is the emotional healing that has taken place. We've been so proud to see each and every one of these guys growing in their gift, growing in their confidence in their gift. And um, just think, you know how sometimes being in the church, growing up in a church, you can get scars? Has anybody ever hurt by anything in the church? Come on, be honest. <laughs> If you're not raising your hand, you're either dead or lying. So <laughs> the church can, people, you know, churches are filled with people, and people hurt people. 
And so um, it's been really wonderful to see that the Holy Spirit in his presence, just being in his presence has brought emotional healing to so many of us. And it's brought a, a new boldness and a new confidence and people are stepping out and doing things that, that maybe um, they never dreamed they would have done before. Uh, every time we gather, uh, we spend a large time in worship and um, inevitably prophetic uh, ministries begins happening just spontaneously, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, that kind of thing. And um, so in, in short, we're, we're allowing the supernatural to operate however, how, whatever God wants to do, we're letting him do it. And he's showing up. He's saying, all I needed was a toehold. And so, yeah, I'm here. If you invite me, I'll come. And he has. Um, and the cool thing about this is, the missional part of it is, this whole time it's been not just allowing the spirit to move and not just to bless us society and family, but it's been a commissioning and everyone that you see up here has been committed to discipling other people. There's already three other groups that have sprung up out of this group where people are starting their own discipleship group. And um, we look for even more of that to happen. And they're, they're, they're training their people to disciple people, to disciple people, to disciple people. So it's, it's a, what we're looking at is a multiplication effect. You know, if you wait for the pastor to do everything, you're going to get addition. Yep. But if you train people to train people to train people to disciple people to disciple people to disciple people, now you have multiplication. And you have an exponential growth in the body of Christ. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So, as they're taking their seats, we have an announcement to make. I told you this was going to be a different day. It's been working in my heart for quite a while. And I wish Pastor Brandon was actually present with us this morning. Because you guys with Pastor Brandon are going to be sending Renee and I out to be missionaries to the Shenandoah Valley. We don't, we don't know what we don't know yet. <laughs> but uh, what this means to us is a discipleship network. Just like we're seeing happening on Thursday nights that we're seeing God move in great ways and we're beginning to multiply disciples. And the end results of that has to be multiplying churches. So we want to serve as catalysts. We want to be those spirit-filled, emboldened catalysts to serve as catalysts of transformation within the Shenandoah Valley to multiply disciples who will multiply churches. Now, you see that plant up there? It was Over here on my left was Julie, beautiful Julie. She's our secret weapon. She's so sweet, but then she'll sneak up on you, and next thing you know, you've got all Jesus has for you right there. Kingdom communities are churches. We encounter the living God and all that we do. We enjoy the community of leaders as we practice the gifts of the Spirit. We grow together in love and power of God. We multiply disciples. We multiply churches. And we, mo we mobilize followers into the harvest field. So when we gather, we gather to go. Go back to that picture real quick. Julie sent me this picture. Success does not look like butts and seats to us. Success to us looks like disciples that begin to make other disciples, that begin to grow out of that and begin to start their own groups of disciple-making that will begin their own groups of disciple-making. They'll begin their own groups of disciple-making. They will have churches. Chuck has already planted the first church that we've seen for a while in Stanton, and it's, it's awesome. I love going over there. They are rocking it. <laughs> That's what success looks like. Isn't it a mess? It would be a beautiful, beautiful mess. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to tell Pastor Brandon what's going on. Wouldn't that be cool? I think he, I think he would like to know, don't you? So I am going to call Pastor Brandon. I know, right? <laughs> Thank you. 
It says this guy. See there? It says Brandon Williams right there. <laughs> Don't. He hung up on me. <laughs> yeah. You guys are so patient. Has this been all right? There we go. Hey, Shane. What are you doing? Uh, I just gave some news to the congregation, and I thought you might want to know. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're we're. What, what, is, what is what is today? Today is November fourteenth. Yeah. What what day of the week? Though? Sunday. Oh, today Sunday. <laughs> oh yeah, you forgot to be here, didn't you? I've been on COVID. Uh, I didn't know what the day was. So. <laughs> is on me now. <laughs> Did you hang up on me? I don't know what happened. That's all we needed to hear, Brandon. Thank you. <laughs> we, I think you needed to hear that we're going to financially support him, Renee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I was, Renee so was good. I think she hung up. Okay. Um, about, uh, so, I just want to speak to Shane first of all and Shane I've told you these things privately countless times but I, I want to say this in front of the congregation I esteem you I value I value you I honor you I respect you I love you I recognize the gifts 
continue and I support and believe in the direction God is leading you for this season to be released to fulfill what's in your heart because you faithfully served this congregation and served alongside me for almost 19 years and I'm incredibly grateful for that thank you love you now I want to commend you to the grace of God and I want to commend you to pursue your calling in this season after listening to you preach this morning I would have to say that's the most concise passionate articulate way you've ever communicated what is in your heart brother (laughs) and so amen amen we're all in and supporting and we're totally behind you thank you pastor brandon now i want to ask the congregation to all stand up and i want to ask you to extend your hands toward the front Let me tell you this, Shane's going to Shane's going to launch this thing uh the 1st of uh, January. So, we've got a few weeks with him and don't, don't worry, Shane's not moving. He still lives 3 miles away and I will still wait on him to come in and preach for me periodically and he's not starting a traditional church. He's starting communities that will multiply and develop more and more communities that will coalesce into a gathering of the people of God. So let's let's pray over Shane, over Renee, over their team. Lord, we commend this team to the grace of God, to the call of God, to the purposes of God. We thank you for this season of preparation that has gone before, this season of learning and discovery and how you have led through this season, how you have directed through this season, how you have uh, made it very clear what your purpose and your desire is for this new season and lord as the the family of god at church on the hill we send them forth with blessing we send them forth with the authority of god to accomplish the purposes of god through the power of god We love them, Lord. We bless them. And we, God, just by the way you design things, are going to be participants and partakers in whatever fruit that is produced in their ministry in the years ahead. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you, Shane. You know that. I love you, church family. I will be with you next Sunday, Lord willing. And uh, Shane will be right there, so he's not going anywhere. And um, we'll we'll continue to uh, unfold what the plan is going to look like for him as we move forward. God bless you all. Thank you. Love you, bro. Wow. (laughs) Well, you guys can pray for us. Um, If you want to give into the ministry, you can give it through Church on the Hill. Note Shane, the Discipleship Network. And guys, you know, we'll be kind of laying stuff out as, as the days come together here in the next few weeks. So. Love y'all so much. You guys have no idea how hard it's been for me not to cry through this whole thing. Because I love y'all so much. Oh, we have a word from Bob. 
That was from the Lord, yeah. I'll let you to judge that. I particularly wanted to speak to the team. Shane and Renee are catalysts in the body of Christ. Paul, when he was wanting to go to Rome, he wrote in Romans, he said, I long to be, come to be with you that I might impart to you a spiritual gift. To you that are in the team, whether you had catalytic tendencies before, Shane has imparted to you by the Spirit a catalytic gift and impartation. You are seeds now, and you're going to be planted, and you're going to produce. And as he said earlier, there's no way to tell how many apples <laughs> are in your lives. And to the rest of you, you may go, ah, yeah, no, that's great. Go, go to it. God has dropped some seed into you. And you can tend to it or you can ignore it. But God, by his spirit, even today, I thought that was so powerful what Pastor Brennan said, the most concise that in all the time that he's heard Shane talk about this, and we've heard Shane talk about it as part of the leadership team for Virginia. It's so clear. God is doing something. And we need to just see it happen, open our hearts to it, and see what God might want to do through each of our lives. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, we wouldn't be talking any of this if it wasn't for the cross. So can we take communion together as we get ready to go? Thank you so much again for your prayers. Oh, while you guys are unpacking, let me just, real quick, real quick, Lynn. I don't know how to close this thing. It keeps happening here. This is for all of us. Uh, I've already given this word to Shane, but Isaiah 42, verse 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they come to pass, I will tell them to you. Sing to the Lord a new song, and that's a new sound. And it's a new sound of worship, it's a new sound of healing, it's a new sound of deliverance, and it's a new sound of joy. But the scripture I got for Shane was out of Isaiah 11. And it says, verse 2, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, and, and Renee, the spirit of the Lord will rest on them, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight, they will delight in the fear of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. So let's right now, let's just begin to receive. Lord, we right now thank you. Lord, as we've talked today, Lord, it all started because you loved us so much that you came and you eliminated the obstacle that has kept us from knowing you, the sin. You allowed the Father to place it on you taking our sin upon yourself and dying as us and raising to new life that we would have resurrection life. So, Lord, as we take of this, this wafer, Lord, we thank you. Lord, for your body that was broken for us. As we take this cup, we thank you for your blood that was shed for us that we may live. We thank you for it. Let's partake in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. 
Well, blessings to every one of you. Thank you so much. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of questions. Renee and I will be around here, and we'll be around for a few weeks. God bless you. Go be on mission.